Many of us can remember what it was like to have a teenage crush on a teacher when you were at high school. But what if that crush turns into something more sinister? What if it becomes obsession? Well, in 1980, one woman would experience just that, the horrifying consequences of one man's dangerous obsession, an obsession stretching back 15 years, resulting in a kidnapping that turned deadly. You may be wondering why, Emma, are you sat on a bed for this video today and not in your normal place and position? Well, that's because I'm gonna to talk to you for a minute about the Emma mattress, one that I have had in my life for many years. I've actually convinced my sister and brother to both have an Emma mattress, and this that I'm sat on is the entire bed itself with Emma mattress and headboard. And when I say the entire bed, I mean the entire bed. As Emma now does a divan in all sizes, which can come with spacious drawers underneath for storage, which, believe me guys, if you're anything like me, you need. And I am obsessed with having a good night's sleep because my husband snores. So therefore, any way that I can contribute to a better night's sleep is amazing at reducing my frustration. Meaning that I probably won't end up in a crime video because of what I've done to him, because he kept me up at night. But on a serious note, I genuinely, as an individual who's worked in therapy for years, think that sleep is so integral to your sense of well-being. And as I've said, this is not one of those situations where I've just been presented or with a mattress to tell you all about it when I don't believe in it. As you will see from what I put up, I bought my first ever mattress about five years ago now, and it is absolutely fundamental to my well-being. I adore it and like I said it's one of those investments that I think is key and just optimal to feeling healthy and happy in your life. So I thought I'm gonna do my true crime video today on said bed. I am feeling incredibly comfortable though I promise you I will not nod off. What's really important to get across before I carry on with today's video is if you do want to try out the Emma mattress then you can get 200 nights trying it and if you don't like it you can return it for free plus you also have an amazing 10 years warranty so that's amazing and i have got an awesome offer for you all you need to do is follow the link and put in emma k as your code and you don't just get 50 percent off that's 50 percent off you can also get an extra exclusive discount on top of that when it comes down to your day-to-day -day living sleep matters massively and i love my M mattress and like I said I just wanted to get it across that this is really authentic my relationship with it and I've just got a new one for my son's room anyway I'm going to move on with today's video but a very big thanks to Emma for that feels like I'm thanking myself there not gonna lie when I first bought the M mattress I was like feels a little bit narcissistic not gonna lie that I'm buying a mattress named after me and when the box turns up and it has Emma written on it it's like it's my box <laughs> Today's video is going to be one that I think very few of you will have heard of and it's also one that I find unbelievably testament to the natural survival mechanisms that very few of us really understand we have until we are faced with a scenario and a situation beyond our control that we have to get through, even when we may feel that there is no hope. So 36-year-old Mary Storfer, she's a teacher. She lives in Hermantown, and this is a city in St. Louis County, that's in Minnesota. She had a husband who's called Irv, and she had an eight-year-old daughter, Beth, and a six-year-old daughter, Steve. Living the American dream, so to speak. Working, happy, hugely in love with her husband as well, just let's note that as well. and bringing up their children together. Now, something else that I think is very significant in this particular video to mention is that they were all devout Christians and they were Christians that did a lot of missionary work. They went abroad to make sure that they carried out their Christian missions and that was a big part of who they were as human beings. In 1980, they were preparing to go on another mission and this time they were scheduled to leave for the Philippines. And 
going to the Philippines would have been a four year Baptist missionary trip. So these guys, they believed absolutely in taking the word of God abroad and obviously building communities and were dedicated beyond what many of us could even align ourselves with to getting the word out. So they were incredibly committed human beings. And the Philippines kind of had some meaning to them. So they'd first been there during 1967 to 68, that was in the school year, and then they'd return there again in 1975. But this time it's a four year stay, so they're moving their children overseas. And as I said, that's a big move to be making, particularly when you've got young children. And when they went out to the places that they went on missions, it was all about starting new churches. In this case, it was about starting new churches in the central islands of the Philippines. But the reality is, the trip was never going to happen. That planned journey was never going to eventuate. So on Friday the 16th of May 1980, Mary is going about her business as you would be doing with such a huge life change about to happen. There are things to sort out, last minute scenarios to solve and preparations for the trip. So she takes Steve, her youngest son, for a haircut in the morning and then later that afternoon, she takes her eight year old daughter, Beth, to get hers cut. This is at Carmen's Beauty Salon, it's off Cleveland Avenue. However, as they leave the salon, this is around 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon, the absolutely unimaginable happens. So Mary is literally just unlocking the passenger side door of her 1973 Ford car. They're approached at this moment by a man. He's got a gun in his waistband. He's, he's early 30s, he's wearing these thick glasses, and at the point that he approaches them, Mary just assumes that he maybe wants directions and then he draws his weapon. And not only does he draw the weapon, he presses it into Beth's side. Now, Barry, trying to do the instant maths on what's playing out here, imagines to herself, well, he probably wants the car. So she's trying to hand over the keys to him. And then he tells her that she needs to drive. So at this point, Mary's believing that maybe he wants to just take the car. She's getting carjacked. And she's trying to hand over the keys and then he tells her that he needs a ride. Obviously, you're in a situation where your child is at risk of being shot. You have a man telling you that he wants a ride. It's amazing how our brain psychologically tries to think about the most positive outcome. Okay, I'll get in the car. I'll take him wherever he needs to go. Because what you think consequentially might occur in that moment is that he might do something utterly catastrophic to your child. So he now has Mary and Beth in the car, he's armed and he's forcing her to drive north. Now bear in mind, this was a bodacious kidnap. It was confident. We are talking about the fact that Mary and Beth were kidnapped on a really busy junction. He'd managed to do that in plain sight. And that in itself is pretty terrifying. Now during the journey, Mary obviously has a deep faith in God and she's trying to reason with this man, this stranger. She tells him that God could help him. She says if he was in trouble, that there's an answer and he just tells her to shut up and drive. And she must have had a huge amount of calm to able to even get those words out. Most people would just be near hysterical or silent, but she's trying to use what she knows about forgiveness and compassion and to get it across to him, but he's having none of it. Now, at one point, a police officer literally pulls up behind them at the junction and this abductor notices straight away and he says, if the car follows them, he's going to shoot Beth. The fear that would be instilled in Mary at that point would just be utterly devastating, terrifying. And of course, her main priority is looking after her child. Above everything else, she wants to ensure that her little girl is safe. But he's also given a really powerful message, isn't it? And that is that he's not afraid of the consequences. Because if the police officer is going to follow them, i.e. if the game's up and he's been caught, he's going to execute a daughter knowing that the police officer is going to add that to the rap list when he gets actually charged with whatever crimes he's charged with in that moment. So he's giving her that message. I don't care about the consequences. And that is really, really worrying, isn't it, for Mary? Because she's going to be sitting there thinking, this guy genuinely doesn't care. 
about what he does in this moment. So the man then directs Mary to a very remote wooded area. It's in Anoka County. And it's at this point he binds Mary and a daughter together with rope, covers the mouth with medical tape, which I just think is one of the most terrifying things to ever encounter because to have your breathing restricted in such a way, certainly for people like myself who've got rhinitis and nasal issues, having something over your mouth is just such a suffocating, trapping feeling. And to be psychologically in a position where it's not just you, it's your child who's enduring this is just so distressing. So after he's done this, he forces them face down in the boot of the vehicle. Whilst driving, Mary and Beth are in the boot and they're making noises because they're obviously very distressed and he's infuriated by this. He's really angry. He doesn't want them to be making a noise. He actually stops the car on two occasions, threatens to kill them. Says, if you don't stop screaming, I'm literally going to execute you. And the first time that he actually stops, Mary's managed to untie Beth. And this just gets him really angry. So it results in him tying them even more tightly. The second time that he stops, well, this is in an undeveloped area near Roseville. He'd actually left his van in a car park nearby at this point. Now, again, Mary's loosened the rope and the guy that's kidnapped them takes a large spare tire and actually places it on top of Mary and Beth in the boot because he's trying to disguise them as much as possible. But whilst he's doing that, what he doesn't initially realise is there are witnesses. He's being watched. There are actually two young local boys who are playing nearby. And whenever you get wasteland, etc., that's exactly what you will have because kids are having adventures. So these two young lads, they've kind of seen what's happening. And one of those boys was six-year-old Jason Wilkman. Now, the car had basically pulled up not very far away from them. And even though he was six years old, the way the guy was acting was suspicious to him. So they approach the vehicle. Kids are inquisitive and curious, aren't they? Bear in mind, they are very young children. So they're not running through the mind that some kind of crime is occurring. They're inquisitive. It doesn't seem right, so they go and investigate. And they approach the vehicle. And this is whilst the driver of the vehicle is busy putting something in the boot. Jason walks around and he kind of looks into the boot and this is whilst his friend remains at the front of the vehicle and what's really terrible is that this childlike curiosity that Jason had well it ended up having deadly consequences for him because he had seen the driver and he'd seen him threatening Mary and her daughter in the boot so the boy's intervention at this point isn't part of the plan and this predator who has these two people in his van suddenly has been disturbed. Jason actually said hi to him. And at that moment, the driver of the van, the abductor, he panics. He grabs Jason, he puts his hand over his mouth, and then he just throws him in the boot with Mary and Beth. Ironically, in spite of the fact that you can ultimately acknowledge that at this moment in time he's trying to remove witnesses, Mark brains who was his friend who was playing he saw all this happen and he ran home and told his parents in fact so he'd only removed one of the witnesses at this point but the guy gets back drives away at speed and this little boy mark brains is left wondering what on earth has played out in front of his eyes and what has happened to his friend jason now in the boot jason's terrified he's crying and mary starts talking to him and tries to soothe him. He confirms that his name is Jason. He tells her that he's six years of age and he just says he just wants to go home. Of course he wants to get home. He tells her that he's visiting his grand that weekend and he's just letting her know that he doesn't know why he's there in that situation. He's terrified. But she tries to soothe him during that experience of traveling together. The car continues for about an hour and then the man drives to Carlos Avery Wildlife Refuge. And it's at this point, he walks to the back of the van, he removes Jason, and he takes the tire iron from the boot. And then he takes Jason into the woods with him. Neither Mary nor Beth ever saw Jason again. 
and the driver, her abductor, would later tell Mary that he had let Jason go. It took about 15 minutes before he came back to the van and resumed the journey, but it's unclear exactly what happened to Jason. But what we do know is that he was murdered by his abductor. They didn't find his remains for a further two months, but he met his doom that day, simply because he was curious about something that seemed different to what he was used to. Somebody just turning up in a van, acting strangely, he checked out that situation, and this was the result. The abductor, from what I've told you about so far, clearly had a plan. You can see that because of the way that he's treated Jason. Jason spoiled that plan. He's literally put a spanner in the works. And so he wanted to make sure that there was nothing else that's gonna get in the way of whatever it is that he's premeditated. He needed to get rid of that child. But his killing was absolutely pointless because Jason's friend saw his face. He had witnessed him abduct Jason and yet he let him escape. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, just a needless, mindless killing. But again, what is that telling us about this particular murderer? He wants to do whatever it is he has decided he is gonna do. He doesn't care about the cost. He doesn't care about the consequences. He's just fixated on his goal. And Mary must have been wondering what on earth his goal was. After another hour's drive, the guy dumps Mary's car and then transfers the mother. After around another hour's drive, the abductor then dumps Mary's car and transfers both her and her daughter into the back of his black van. There's no windows in the back and he ties them up. They must have felt completely helpless at this moment in time. Then he actually drives to an electronic business that he owned. So we're talking about an individual who essentially is a professional. He's a businessman. He owns something called Sound Equipment Services. And it was a successful business. By this time, night's fallen. So you can imagine, they've had no opportunity to go to the toilet, they've had no food or drink, and he allows them at this point to use the toilet and then gives them something to drink so that they at least have their thirst satiated. But then he blindfolds them. He restrains them again. He puts them back in the van. He's told them nothing at this point as to what his intentions are. Then he drives them to his house near Roseville. This is just six miles away from Mary's apartment. And that's where they're introduced to what would be their home for the foreseeable future. And their home was a closet in a back bedroom. And that closet measured just 21 inches wide and four feet long. He chained them together like animals and he removed the doorknob as well from the inside so that he could lock them in fully. They were at his complete control. And again, at this point, no idea as to how on earth their life has gone from being in a situation where they're about to embark on their adventures to the Philippines to being prisoners in this man's closet. Mary was able at this point to observe that there must have been a plan behind what had happened that day. She could see that there was evidence of it. She knew it hadn't been an opportunistic crime. She recognized that the closet itself had been completely cleared. Also, it looked like it had been prepared for their arrival because there was a small old rug and a couple of small pillows on the floor. This is something that he knew he'd need. There were blankets and plastic bags on the shelves. There was a bucket and a toilet roll so that they could relieve themselves if they needed to. And also there was a light bulb with a pull cord. So suddenly this opportunistic carjacking that she initially believed she might be dealing with became something far more sinister. Whilst all this is happening to Mary and Beth, there is concern now growing for the missing mother and child in her local community. She hasn't returned from the hairdressers. And Mary's husband Irv felt immediately there was something really wrong because Mary's sister arrived for dinner as they had planned to meet one another that way. But Mary and Beth weren't there. So they hadn't canceled that situation. That's something that Mary would have done if she had known that she wouldn't be present. So Irv then thinks, well, I'll 
call Carmen's beauty salon or check on whether they've been there, whether they're running late. Hairdresser tells them, oh no, they left at 4.30 p.m. Then he thinks, okay, this doesn't feel good. Maybe they've been in an accident. So that's understandable. It's one of the first things that you can't help allowing your mind to wander to, isn't it? We've all been in scenarios where somebody who we love doesn't turn up on time. And you can't help but fearing the worst at times. So friends from the church, they start helping him ring around all the local hospitals. But there's no trace. It's like they've disappeared. So later that night, uh, with growing concerns, reports the disappearance of the police. Now, for the police, this adds a bigger problem to an already huge issue that they're dealing with because they've got their hands full. Because a local boy, six-year-old Jason Wilkman, he's been abducted. His friend had witnessed that abduction happen in plain sight. He'd watched the boy vanish with this man. And at the end of the day, abductions didn't happen in this area. The police were absolutely blindsided. But what they could never have connected in that moment was that they were dealing with the same abductor that that little boy was taken by the very people that Irv was looking for, that Mary and Beth were also victims at this moment in time, that these crimes were related. Remember though, Jason's friend who had seen his friend be abducted was stood at the front of the vehicle, so he hadn't seen Mary and Beth in the boot. Because this was all kicking off and the police were clearly very concerned about the welfare of this child, it meant that the officers didn't actually arrive for a couple of hours. And Irv said, you know what? I genuinely feel that the police didn't take the situation seriously, that the police officer believed it was likely a domestic issue. It won't be the first time that a mother and daughter disappear. It won't be the first time that a row has broken out and people take some space from each other. But that was his assumption. There'd been a bust up and the mother had left with the daughter. But very soon after that, the police's opinion drastically altered. And the reason for that is that Jason's friend takes the police to the abduction site and the officers are looking around. And one of the things that turns up, well, it's a license plate. Because as the abductor had driven away at speed, the number plate had been torn off by the foliage. And that was Mary's vehicle's number plate. So the police now realize the same man that had taken that little boy had actually abducted three people in total. So there's a massive search that goes underway, massive. Bear in mind, today, CCTV is everywhere, but the time frame I'm talking about, it didn't exist in this respect, which is why it was so important for police and volunteers to come together to start looking around the area for clues. And that's what happens. Massive search is underway. It comprised of 300 officers. There were volunteers from the community, from the church. But in spite of their efforts, and there were huge efforts in that moment, they wouldn't find any trace of the missing woman, the missing girl, or the missing boy. As you would imagine, when the police first start looking at this, who do they zone in on? They're like, hmm, who is most likely to have carried out said crimes? And Irv is the initial suspect. Of course he is, because instantly all investigators are alike. It's far more likely that you are the murderer because you have contact with this individual and you're in a relationship with them and then the likelihood is that you're the person who's carried out the murder. But of course, Irv is completely innocent. He passes a lie detector test. So he'd obviously been questioned at length. And after the police finish interrogating him, they say he's not a suspect at all. But the locals around Irv, they weren't necessarily that convinced because one of the problems was the police artist produced this drawing of a suspect that they're looking for. And I have to say, it was a similar look to Irv. So both had got very dark hair, both had dark glasses, and the newspapers, you won't be surprised, they thought, oh, we want to sell a few papers here. How can we make it a bit more interesting? What we'll do is we'll get Irv's photo with the drawing alongside the potential abductor perpetrator. So, you know, doing that and placing them together, it was all about promoting this idea of possibility of suspicion on Irv. Even though he'd been discounted from the case, he was dealing with the horror. 
the absolute horror of his wife and his daughter going missing. And now, basically, society is looking at him and thinking that he might be the individual who's harmed them. So it really didn't help matters that uh, got all this going on. And the police said that they were inundated with calls because everyone thought that Mary's husband was the culprit. So this isn't helpful at all. And this is where the press can cause real problems because all the while that they are deflecting attention from the reality of this abduction, all the time they are placing potential suspicion on Earth, even though he's been discounted from being a part of this, that's time ticking that allows the abductor to feel confident, that also places distance between the crime and the actual criminal, and means that Mary and Beth are even more unsafe than they already were. We get to the second day of the abduction. It's at this point that Mary, shockingly, learns the identity of her abductor. So he blindfolds her, and then he takes her into the living room. He sits her on a blanket on the floor, and he ties her to a piece of furniture. Now bear in mind, at first she hadn't recognised him at all, but then he proceeded to conduct a three hour videotaped interview. So he sits there and videos her. In fact, this isn't gonna be the only thing that he records whilst he holds Mary captive, but he does this almost interrogation. He talks about a class of hers that she'd once taught. And he says, do you remember a student who developed a formula for an algebra problem. And then bit by bit, he starts to reveal exactly who he is. And suddenly his identity dawns on Mary. He was a former ninth grade maths student. That was between the years of 1965 and 66 that she'd taught before. That was 15 years before we're talking about this moment. So this guy is talking about a situation that unfolded a decade and a half ago. Ming Sen Shu was 14 at the time. He's now 29 years of age. So she had actually taught him algebra. This was during her two years at Alexander Ramsey High School that was in Roseville. Mary's shocked that this guy remembers her so profoundly because to her, he just seemed like a really regular student. There was nothing concerning about him. In fact, when she recalled the kind of student that he was, he was very bright, he was very capable, and she remembered him as well because he was one of her first students who was a Taiwanese American. She said he took part in football and wrestling. And Mary, throughout her years of teaching in that situation and scenario, was completely unaware of the fact that he had this schoolboy crush on her. And she only found out later down the line when one of the former students told her. Now, what she didn't know was that this innocent crush that many young people deal with when they're at school. I know some of you will be like, Emma, there are very slim pickings at my school. Listen, I know. I went to an all girls school. I couldn't even force myself to have a crush on any of the teachers there. Believe me. It's not as if I didn't try. But you know, a lot of people do. A lot of people do. And it's one of those things that is noted as part and parcel of being a teacher and kids get over it. It's a way of them testing feelings in a safe space, usually, unless of course the teachers are not right and then it can go horribly wrong. But you know what I'm saying? There's that kind of rehearsing scenario when you allow yourself to kind of feel excited about seeing somebody because you kind of fancy them, even though you know it's not gonna go anywhere. But Mary hadn't noticed this even when he had had a crush on her until she was told about it. Turns out that it wasn't just a crush. This had become a fixation, an obsession. He had huge sexual fantasies about her. He was completely infatuated. And as opposed to that obsession diminishing, it grew and grew and grew. And he'd later tell her, you are lucky that I got you when I did with a minimum of your family exposed because I would have done anything to take you. The fact that he's basically letting her know. If your husband had been there, if your extended family had been there, wouldn't have mattered. I would have taken you anyway. Now, she was born on the 15th of October 1950 in Taiwan. It's when he's eight years of age. He moves to Minnesota. That's with his mother and his two siblings. 
professional family. His father was a professor at the University of Minnesota. Sadly, he died three years after they moved there. And one of the things that was noted about Shu when he was growing up was that he had a really violent nature. His mother described him as a completely uncontrollable child. She even said that she felt really scared of him, which I think is one of the marks of true concern when we have children that actually terrify us as the caregiver. I think that the vast majority of parents, we want what's best for our children, we tend to believe the best in our kids, and if we see something in childhood that starts to alert those alarm bells, it tends to be for good reason. Because you do have rose-coloured spectacles, you are looking at a child in their best light because you are the biggest cheerleader. And when you're scared of what they're developing into, or the traits that you know about them, then we really have to be concerned about their form for the future. She said that even when he was a kid, she looked at him and said he had no feelings. He was like a dog. Although, with respect, even though she describes as him having no feelings like a dog, I just want to put it out there. Bad analogy. Dogs have lots of feelings. Dogs are very sentient. Dogs have massive empathy. Dogs are incredibly loyal. Dogs are brill. Just putting it out there. But that was her perspective. So he was also seen to frequently beat his younger siblings, and that was both during childhood and adolescence. So he's very violent. And as he grew into a teenager, he starts doing things like throwing rocks at vehicles, which is obviously criminal and very, very dangerous. And then he actually started fires in apartments of three strangers. At the point when he's 14, he gets ordered to participate in psychotherapy because clearly there are issues with this young person. And what we're talking about, this quite high-level aggression, imparting fear into your caregivers, setting a fire to things, throwing rocks at vehicles which could cause death, this is deeply disturbing behaviour. Also, Mary finds out that this man, this person who, as far as she was concerned, was just a kid from her past, he'd been stalking her for a decade and he had become fixated on her completely. And what she finds out, which is even more disconcerting, is the kidnap that he succeeded in wasn't the first one that he tried. He had tried to kidnap her on at least four different occasions before he finally succeeded. That 15 years of obsession, just amazing to see that it culminates in this brazen armed double kidnapping in broad daylight. He was never gonna give up, was he? Turns out when he starts to talk about the fact that this wasn't the first time he tried to get her, that five years earlier, she had actually graduated from stalking her to actually going ahead and trying to take her. It was the 4th of July, 1975. So Mary, her husband, and the children at the time, they were on a mission in the Philippines. So they're away. She doesn't know this. So even though he's stalking her, what I would say is at this point, his stalking behavior is not on point because he believes that he's breaking in to Mary's apartment, but she actually breaks into Mary's in-law's house. This is in Duluth, because he thinks it's Mary's house. So he confused Irv Stauffer Sr. with Irv Stauffer Jr. So he goes in, threatens Irv Sr. at this point with a gun and tells him to get his wife into the room. She comes in, it's obviously not Mary. He realizes he's made a mistake and it's Mary's mother-in-law. So after he realizes that this isn't Mary's place in space, he ties them up and then he says that he's gonna kill them if they ever tell the police. They never reported it to the police. I know, they never reported it. It intrigues me, that kind of behavior. Isn't it incredible how fear can psychologically trap you in these scenarios? I mean, for the most part, if somebody came into my apartment, threatened me, tied me up, and then told me that I shouldn't tell the police, the minute I managed to get myself out of that scenario, I would be like on the phone screaming. But their belief in that moment was probably, well, he didn't hurt us, but if he comes back after finding out that the police have been told, then he may. So they didn't do anything. But 
to some degree, that chain of causation essentially leads to what we're dealing with and what I'm talking about right now. Now, Mary and their son, they would only find out about this situation following the abduction. So it's only after Mary and Earth find out that this had actually happened to his parents that they connected the pieces. Shoe's stalking at this point takes an even more sinister turn because it's something that he absolutely intends to achieve. He's gonna get her. So he, at this point, he learns that Mary's moved into the Baptist missionary apartments in Arden Hills. And she and her were planning to remain there for about a year because they were obviously gonna go abroad again. It's whilst at this apartment, she ends up spying on them from the woods outside. He knew the toys that Beth would play with, what she had in her room. He even knew where she kept the spare key. Now in hindsight, Mary says that she believes the reason that he abducted her on that day is because he probably saw them packing crates because obviously he's spying on them constantly. So he realized that they must have been leaving soon and that meant that he was time limited. He had to make his move quickly. Apparently prior to the abduction that was successful, he'd tried to break in through the patio doors. He'd used a blowtorch at that point He'd actually managed to enter a storage area beneath the property. So he was really determined. He'd cut holes in the floor underneath of their bed. That's right. He literally cut holes in the floor underneath the bed. So he was thinking about all these different ways that he was going to be able to achieve his goal. And Herb noticed that there was sawdust on the floor, but he just swept it up. Couldn't figure out how it had got there, but didn't really think anything of it because that's the way we are in life. We hardly think to ourselves when we see a bit of sawdust on the floor, you know what that'll be? That'll be somebody about to abduct my wife. But that's actually what's going on. So after Mary has been videotaped and Shu has finally revealed who he is, Shu then has the very big reveal the justification for his actions. And I would imagine that some of you have got different ideas as to why he's done this running through your head. But let me tell you, let me tell you, it probably isn't gonna result in the one that you'd imagine. Yes, the reason that he has abducted this woman and her child and been trying to abduct her for, you know, over a decade and a half, the reality is that it's down to a very strange thing. Apparently, she didn't encourage him enough when he revealed a mathematical formula that he'd developed. Yep, she wasn't enthusiastic enough when he told her about some kind of formula that he'd come up with. She didn't give him the right kind of feedback, and that was his justification. But actually, there is a little bit more. There is one extra thing that apparently means that Mary deserves what's happening to her right now. He also claims that she dared to give him a B in algebra. I mean, personally, if somebody gave me a B in algebra, I think I'd won the lottery. If I had been at school being given anything like a B, I would have been thrilled. I'd have been the person buying you a present at the end of the year because you were a nice teacher. Particularly if you'd given me a B in algebra, because it would mean that you were lying and you just clearly were trying to be kind to me. But for him, this is a slight on his pure academic performance because he had this perfect academic record and he said that B, that one B, cost him his college scholarship. He said because of that he couldn't afford to attend college and subsequently because of that one solitary B that he was given, he'd been forced to fight in the Vietnam War. He then said he was a prisoner of war because of it and he blamed Mary for all of it. He wanted revenge, he wanted to unburden this hatred that he'd carried for years. And essentially he tells her that he wants to debase her as she had debased him 15 years ago. Now, if we were to go down the line and logic of this is a man traumatized by being a prisoner of war, trying to make sense of the feelings that he has to deal with day in, day out, trying to manage how his life went from being a straight A student to unraveling to this position where he had his freedom stolen from him and where he had to see the most terrible things in war 
and that he draws it down to this moment and believes that Mary was responsible for it, whilst it's still outlandish and ridiculous and there's no reasoning to ever do this to someone, you could psychologically imagine that there was a level of emotional distress and that he had lost his mind believing that she was the individual who deserved all of these feelings projected onto her. You know, we could stretch to conceive that that could in some kind of world happen, but actually what I've just told you turns out to just all be lies. Yeah, just all mind games. In reality, it turns out that Shu was voted most likely to succeed. So yeah, at high school, he was the one who stood out. Also, he could have secured a scholarship literally anywhere. He ended up attending the University of Minnesota, and after he graduated successfully, he became an owner of a successful electronics store. And by the way, he never, ever bought in Vietnam. So this is just all a fantasy in his mind. And again, to some degree, he's telling her this because he wants her to feel that he has a valid reason behind what he's done. So he's trying to make her to be the predator. She's the problem. She deserves this. That she's gonna now experience the tiny fragment of pain that he's had to endure because of what she did. It's a way of allowing what he's doing in his mind to be acceptable. She also played these mind games constantly. So he said that he was gonna kill the family if they tried to escape. He also told Mary that he'd hurt Beth if she didn't do exactly what he asked. And if you really wanna get somebody to do something and they have children, you threaten the children. You'll do anything, even lay down your life for your child. So it's a very effective way to use the girl as a pawn. It's a way of controlling and manipulating Mary and ensuring that he gets whatever he wants. Now, during Mary's captivity, she just used it as an opportunity to play out these warped desires that he had on a daily basis. He'd already written lots of sexual fantasies about multiple women, and these included Mary. And in these fantasies, he basically would rape them and then they'd beg for more. It was a way of making them feel that even though it was wrong, somehow it was made right by the fact that he concocted these stories where they were asking for it. And Ace Head, without a doubt, in his warped logic, he genuinely believed that Mary and he were gonna have a future together. He believed that they could have this loving relationship. It didn't matter how twisted it had began. As far as he was concerned, it could become something beautiful, in his twisted mind anyway. But when you look at how he treated Mary, this is so far from reality. It's so far from the norm what he's doing because he repeatedly rapes Mary. And don't get me wrong, he leaves Beth in the closet when he's doing this, she's not seeing this. But of course, it means that Mary knows that if she doesn't do exactly what he says, Beth is locked up. And he tells Mary, I don't want your scars to be physical. I want them to be emotional. I want you to feel dirty, debased and degraded. So he absolutely knows what he wants to do and he knows what he wants to achieve and he enjoys the power. But it feels like he at the same time as inhabiting these feelings and experiences has quite a confused connection with what's occurring. Like he has a state of mind that isn't necessarily playing out in a way that makes sense. Even though without a doubt he's sane during these scenarios. It's that in some of the recordings that he makes, he starts saying that he understands that what he's doing is wrong. So he says, I know, I know it's an evil thing, isn't it? But it doesn't stop him. So he's got this cognitive dissonance. He knows he shouldn't be doing it, but he's doing it. He knows it's wrong, but he wants to do it anyway. And on one occasion, this is when he's discussing why he would rape Mary. He says, I'm not saying it's right. I know it's not right but that's the way I've chosen it. So again, he notes what is incorrect, he notes what he should feel bad about, but his desires are stronger than his morals. If he has any morals at all, and I don't think he does. I think on a scale of one to a hundred, morals versus no morals, he's on 6,723. Mary, when she was asked questions about how often he videoed her, 
she said that she estimated that he videoed at least six hours of him raping her and he loaned that video camera that video camera actually had to be returned and the behavior carries on again and again and again this is on a daily basis but just the videotapes alone recorded six hours of that horrific abuse one of the major fears when she's dealing with what is unquestionably the most terrifying scenario you know being treated this way by a stranger by somebody so out of control by somebody so utterly disgraceful in the way that they treat you with no care or consideration for your feelings that alone is unbearable but knowing that your daughter is in a scenario where she could become a victim for mary that was always terrifying she always believed there was a potential that he was going to assault her daughter but he ends up saying you know i'm not a child molester and i don't want to do anything with your daughter and to be fair he didn't touch beth and he never had her present during the sexual assaults but he constantly threatened it so it's always using a weapon and the weapon in the shape of her daughter to basically prevent her from feeling that she had any escape whatsoever and on one occasion she actually says that he's unhappy with the way that mary is responding to him it's not enough that he is forcing himself on her no now he wants her to be physically affectionate with him he wants her to respond in an affectionate manner whilst he's literally making her do things that she doesn't want to do and he tells her that she has to be more loving and this is something that is testament to mary there is just something so powerful about this when she says to him i'm sorry i can't do that i love my husband and i promised to be true to him until my death and what you ask i cannot do his response to this very real reaction where she's expressing how her commitment is to her husband in god's eyes is to punish her in a terrifying way he goes over and gets a very large plastic bag goes over to where beth is in the closet and he says to mary have you ever seen anyone die by suffocation then he gets the plastic bag he places it over her head and her entire body and under her feet and he leaves her that way for several minutes and he tells mary that in the end your daughter is going to suffocate slowly she had to watch as sweat trickled down her daughter's face and as that plastic bag started to close around her daughter's body. So Mary kissed him on the cheek and he said, it's not enough. And he only removed that bag from Mary's daughter when she kissed him on the mouth. It's just another example of how he uses Beth against her. And also, of course, she's helpless. Of course, she's going to kiss him. But it doesn't change what she said. It doesn't change that Mary has made it clear to him that she'll never be his. He can take her physically, but he cannot take her spiritually. He can't change how she feels about her husband, Irv. Every day, Mary wondered if it was gonna be her last. She didn't know whether she'd ever get through it alive. This man had no intention of setting them free, but she felt like she had to stay strong for her daughter. She needed to, convince Beth that everything's going to be okay, that it will work out. Now bear in mind we've got Mary who's this devout Christian and clearly she has lots of stories that she wishes to impart to give strength to her daughter Beth and she does. She tells her lots of stories to try to give her hope and one of those is by the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Peter was basically imprisoned and he was due to be killed the next day but God sent an angel to save him. And her daughter asked her, do you think an angel will let us out of the closet and let us go home again? And you can understand, can't you, that her daughter is trying to kind of rationalize what the mother's saying. She trusts the mother. She believes in the mother. She trusts God. And there is always a reason. That's what Christians are taught to believe, that God's always present for you, even in the bad times, even when things go horribly wrong, God's still present. And this little girl is trying to figure out, is he? Is he really present? And if he is present, why isn't he with us? And of course, Mary's trying to do her best to help her understand that 
this is something that they have to trust in spite of what they're dealing with in that moment. Now, on one occasion, he actually takes Beth to work with him. Now, Mary's locked in the closet at that point, and he left Beth confined in a box in the van that he has on a day that's absolutely roasting. It's incredible that she did not suffocate, genuinely. You think about how many stories there are about animals dying in cars that are hot. Well, that could have happened to her. And even though she was in that van, and to some degree there was a possibility that she could have escaped, she didn't try to, because he made it clear to her, if you dare, I'll kill you, mum. So he's testing parameters, isn't he? He's testing boundaries. How much can he control these individuals? How can he play them off against one another? It's very powerful. And every time they don't try to leave and escape is another bolstering for his confidence, taking them to these places, keeping them separate, but making sure that they know that there are consequences for the other should they dare to assert their freedom. That is a prison. For each of these individuals, Mary and Beth are in prison because of this psychologically. So as Shu's confidence is growing and is feeling a little bit more in control of Mary and her daughter, he starts relaxing some of the control a little bit. So he allows them, for example, to eat in the kitchen with him after a week. Then after 10 days, he allows them to have a shower. He even buys a television and some board games for Beth and he starts playing the board games with her. He starts calling her Bethy, which is weird because that wasn't her name. And certainly when we're gonna talk about terms of endearment and affection, I don't really think that she would want these kind of terms applied by him. He's creepily affectionate with respect towards Beth. And to me, Again, it's psychologically confusing, isn't it? Because he's being nice on one hand, but he's threatening to kill her. As far as Mary is concerned, when he talks to her about what he'll do to her daughter if she refuses to do things that he wants. So it's just absolutely a juxtaposition. On one hand, he's being affectionate and playing games. On the other hand, he's threatening to kill her. Imagine balancing that and knowing from moment to moment how to just survive it. So even though Mary and Beth are clearly living in an absolute nightmare, in spite of the fact that he has this tight control over them, more of a routine, I would say, is established. So Mary and Beth are, for example, allowed to go and eat outside of their closet. They're also allowed to go to the bathroom now. But at all other times, they're bound together and confined in the tiny closet. This is whilst Shu is at work. And again, that's because he wants to make sure that they aren't seen. And also, he likes knowing that he's fully in control. There's nothing more tantalizing to predators than to imagine that you can be away from your captives and they still behave themselves. That's pure control and domination. And that's what he enjoys. Now bear in mind that Mary and Beth are big news. So she's evidently aware that the police are looking for both Mary and her daughter. So he starts concocting ideas about what he's gonna need to do to diminish the search. So he makes Mary write three letters. Now, one implies to the police that she hadn't been abducted. Of course, it's that classic one. I haven't been abducted. I've just left and taken my daughter. I've been seen nowhere. I've used no money. Literally, nobody has seen any remnants of who I am or who I've been during the period that I've gone missing, but it's just that I've left to go somewhere else. It's not gonna fly. Because like I said, if you're just gonna go away from your husband, people are gonna see you. You're gonna be in contact with families. It's one of those scenarios that for an abductor might seem purist, or oh, it'd be really nice, get them to call off the search. But to any officer of the law is going to immediately be suspicious. And like I said, the big thing is, well, have they been using money? Have they been using any form of credit card? Have they spoken to family members? Because if you have an issue with your partner, it's not gonna play out that you have an issue with the rest of your family. You're gonna have contacted someone. So that letter's written, but it's not gonna be that much use. Then there's the second letter, and this is to tell the police to stop searching or she would never be seen again. A little bit narcissistic there, Shu. A little bit on the narcissistic side. Just gonna... 
Oh, guys, guys. Yeah? Yeah? Guys, you're not going to believe this. What is it? Honestly, it's a, it's a letter from Mary and Beth's abductor, and they basically said, you either call off the search or something terrible is going to happen. Well, there's only one thing for it, isn't there? What's that then? We call off the search. Totally. But, again, just tells you, doesn't it? This guy, this guy believes that he can control the world. But that's the second letter. And then the third letter was to her parents. And she tells her exactly what to write during this period of time. He tells her exactly what she's got to say. And during this period of writing them, he makes sure that she doesn't use any kind of secret code because he's paranoid and believes that potentially she will try to let them know something about her location if he allows her to send these. What is confusing in all of this scenario? Forget what you've heard about from me. Forget the fact that he's trying to get her to write letters to the police, to call off the search, to say that she's left, to her parents and so on and so forth. The fact that he's taken this poor woman for reasoning that just makes absolutely no sense and has no logic. You have to also remember that at this very same moment in time, Shu is going about his business absolutely normally. Anyone who knew him suspected nothing. His life just carried on absolutely typically. He went to work, he continued his normal days, and the people who knew him during that period, they said he was acting completely normally. Bearing in mind that on occasions Beth was in a van outside, he was acting completely normal. It just did not worry him. You have to imagine what on earth the normal person would be feeling if they had some kind of kidnap victim in their home, let alone in their van outside. But nothing. Cool as a cucumber. And empathy doesn't exist, does it? in that person. Now we get to over a month of captivity. Imagine that. She's been away with her daughter in these hostile conditions, having to endure the most terrible abuse, and this is over a month. And this is in June 1980. She hires this Winnebago. And he decides that they're gonna go to a job fair in Chicago. So he tells Mary and Beth that they're gonna go on this road trip. And incredibly, whilst they're on this road trip, he takes them shopping at the mall for new clothes, but he keeps Beth close to him because he knows that Mary's not going to try and get help if he is a risk to her daughter. Now, Mary does actually try to leave a clue because she pays using a traveller's cheque, and that in itself should have alerted somebody because of the fact it's her name, but authorities didn't even get alerted when the cheque was cashed. And while Shu attends that fair, he even leaves Mary and Beth tied up in the motorhome and he says to them that he's tied them to a fuel line and says that they'll explode if they try to escape. Terrifying, because even though you might think in your head, well, has he really? Realistically, could he have done that? Are you going to risk it? The thing about the human condition is, there's always hope. Yeah, I could try and escape now, but he's saying that my life's at risk. Or, I could wait and hope for a better occasion. I could gain his trust further, and then one day, I'll get to leave. So, staying in that scenario, in that Winnebago, it kind of makes sense, because he's told them there is a direct threat to their life. Now, Beth, at one point, is left in the Winnebago by herself, but bear in mind her mother's with him. So, at this point, she doesn't think that the place is gonna blow up if she leaves, but she knows that deep harm could come to her parent if she dares to try to escape. So what she does do really bravely is she manages to get the attention of some boys and she basically begs them for help. She tells them that she's been kidnapped, but they think she's joking and they leave. Now, I don't know about you. I'm just going to throw it out there. <laughs> when I was a kid, I would have been like, I'm totally believing that because I read books like The Famous Five well, like a group of kids could solve crimes. And we had the Red Hand Gang, and I was all about being a hero. I was always looking around. 
I either wanted there to be an injured animal that I could sort out and look after and bring home, or I wanted there to be something that I could discover that was a crime playing out and suddenly I'd solve it. You know, always felt that way and don't deny it, a lot of you feel that way as well. So if I had had a kid from Winnebago being like, I've been kidnapped, I'd have been like, you, stay there. I'm going to call the police. I would then have had to have located a phone box because we didn't have mobile phones when I was a kid. And then I would have called it before responding back to said abductee, waiting for the police and hoping I got a picture in the local newspaper and ideally some kind of gifts offered to me from my local toy shop. Throwing it out there. Maybe you feel the same. But these guys didn't. They were like, you're taking the mick and off they went. But that's really sad because it could have been resolved in that moment. Now, 30 days into the abduction, we get to Father's Day and this is unreal. She decides to let Beth call her father and she does. And it's just so distressing for Irv. Bear in mind, his daughter and his wife have just disappeared. And then all of a sudden, he's speaking to her. He's asking her if she's okay. Now the FBI actually record that conversation. You can hear that Irv is trying not to cry and he even asks his daughter, can I speak to the person who's got you? And she says no. And on one level, it would be reassuring, it would be comforting to know that they're alive, but on another, what is Shu doing in that moment? He's psychologically letting Irv know, I have your wife, I have your children. Yeah, he's allowing her to call Irv and that will bring Irv some comfort, but also it demonstrates the arrogance and also the fact that he's letting Irv know. They're mine now. There's nothing you can do about it. Hello, Irv speaking. Hello, Dad. Yes, Bethy. Are you okay? Yeah. Is Mommy okay? Yes. That's good. Oh, I'm... Mommy, happy, yes. Happy Father's Day. Oh, thank you so much, sweetie. We can't talk anymore. Um, when can you come home? I don't know. Can I talk... Can I talk to him? Can I talk to him? No. On the 4th of July, this is 1980, Shu again has this confidence to just take them out in public. He takes them to Como Park. He takes them to Hardy's restaurant and then he takes them to the University of Minnesota campus to watch the fireworks. But bear in mind, Mary and Beth have been under his threat for a relatively long period of time. She's scared. She doesn't feel like she can raise the alarm. He's always got Beth near him. She always believes that she could be killed because he's always armed. And it's at this point that Mary says that she even began herself to give up a little bit of hope. She didn't think she was going to get rescued. And it gets even worse when she says he's going to buy a mobile home and that mobile home is going to be where they live. Because she realises, well, they haven't found us at his home. What will it be like if we're on the road constantly? And the states are huge. I mean, you can disappear easily. So she believes that if something doesn't change, this may well be her life for the rest of her life. 7th of July, 1980. This is day 53 of captivity. She's at work. Mary and her daughter are, as ever, chained to the bedroom door. And this meant that they could just move around a little, but they were quite restricted. Mary notices at this point that the cable that they're tied to is secured to a hinge pin which is on the closet door and she starts thinking to herself which is incredibly bright because I don't think I would do this and like I said when you're in these scenarios the way that you think is often controlled by fear not necessarily by how you're going to remove yourself from that situation but the technical understanding that she has in the moment where she thinks about this scenario for me is astounding because she thinks to herself if I remove that hinge pin then we might be able to escape she doesn't expect when she starts trying to move it that it's going to come out but when she tries to her amazement it just comes out really easily she said it was almost as if the pin was greased and she took it in that moment to be a sign from God. She really believed that was God 
letting her know. Because bear in mind, she had told her daughter these stories and her daughter had struggled with certain things because she was thinking to herself, well, why would God deny us our escape? Why would God want us in this situation? Why would God not want us to be free of this? And at the same time, she was trying to help her daughter understand that there might be a point where they would try to escape. So it's that fine balance. And in this moment, she's saying, this is a sign. This is a sign. So now they've managed to escape from the closet. They're still bound together, but they can move. And of course, they've established by this point that she was definitely not home. So they venture out of the bedroom. They find the phone in the kitchen and they ring the police. And they're actually able to get the address because there's a dry cleaning tag that they find. Mary then speaks to Ramsey County Sheriff's Office and says exactly who she is. She says there's a mother and a daughter who's been abducted. The officer straight away says, is Jason with you? And Mary said it's at this point, ultimately, that she realised that Jason would never be going home. She realised that Jason must be dead. And she said that that realisation just hit her so hard. Because until that moment in time, for the police, they believed that Jason was being held with the other kidnap victims. And of course, for Mary, she believed that Jason had potentially been dropped off as she'd been told by Shu, but their worlds collided in that reflection and recognition that it was never going to be a case of that boy coming home. The reality was that Shu had murdered him. It must have been absolutely horrific to have been the parents of Jason, to discover that two of the victims of the same kidnap were still alive, but not their six-year-old son. After Mary made the call to the police, both Mary and Beth wait by the front door, but every second feels like an hour. And every second makes them feel like they are one second closer to danger. That she could be here any moment and that he would ultimately harm them. That he would ultimately do what he'd promised, take their lives. But even though the police had told them to stay in, they started to get really, really nervous. Every second would have felt like an hour. Of course it would, and bear in mind, she was told Mary, and Beth, that he watches them all the time. That every single second of every single day, he has eyes on them. So they fear that he will have seen them leaving the closet, using the phone, and of course, he will be heading back so that he can carry out his threats. Because ultimately, they've been under his power for a long period of time, and they know that he has the capability and capacity to do them harm. And Mary's just discovered that the likelihood is, is He's a murderer of that little boy. So she knows he's a child killer, meaning her child is definitely at risk. So ultimately, they venture outside and then they wait in the backyard. This is for the police to arrive. Initially, two unmarked police cars pull up and this is good because you don't want to alert somebody who's a threat that the game is up. So sending those unmarked police cars is important. And at this point, the officers are looking around and fortunately, they find Mary and Beth crouched behind this old car. And thank God, it wasn't long after that that Mary and Beth are reunited with her family. Believe me guys, by the way, the story doesn't end here. So don't be tuning out, because this case, it's gonna get crazier. Now, when they find Mary and Beth, of course, they were tethered to each other. They had the cables and the bicycle locks on them and they'd been held for over seven weeks. They'd survived that hell for over seven weeks. After Mary and Beth are safe, she was then arrested pretty soon after at his workplace. Came very quietly. And he's charged with multiple offences. And he faces two trials, in fact. So one is for the first degree murder and kidnap of six-year-old Jason Wilkman. Whilst in custody, he also claims that he knows exactly where Jason's body is, but he just refuses to disclose it, which is just, Again, that domination playing out, isn't it? How dare he? He's a six-year-old little boy and he's refusing to let people know where the body is so that his parents can at least bring him home. That in itself demonstrates just how malevolent this human being is. Bear in mind, he's been caught bang to rights. Everybody knows that he's the individual who's carried it out. And arguably, at least by giving the parents the level of respect they deserve by showing them where his body is, it would, to some degree, 
demonstrate a level of accountability, maybe not remorse, but a willingness to accept he had no right to what he did. And on top of this charge for Jason's murder, he faces his second trial for the offences relating to the abduction of Mary and her daughter, also for the multiple sexual offences against Mary. But for Mary, believe me, the ordeal is not over. It really isn't. So bear in mind the fact that Shu has made it very, very clear to her from the beginning that if they are ever caught, if he is ever reprimanded for what's occurred, he's going to find her once he's released from prison. And that if she is dead when he's let out of prison, well, simple, he'll just go after her children. He told her that no matter what, no matter what sentencing, no matter how things played out, the one thing she could bargain on was that she would never, ever be safe. Whilst Shu is in custody, this is whilst awaiting his trial. This is at the point where one may imagine, maybe I should temper some of my behaviours. Maybe I shouldn't go around doing things that make me seem even more guilty than I already am. One would imagine those kind of things, but not Shu. Shu offers his cellmate, Richard Green, $50,000 to kill Mary and Beth. Now, Green at this point is just about to be released, so there is a potential for him to go ahead and do that. And Shu's meaning behind this is because he doesn't want them to testify against him. I don't think that Shu has figured out that at the end of the day, he still did it, and that by killing the two witnesses to the crime and being responsible for planning said killings wouldn't change a thing because they wouldn't need to testify because he'd have killed them, meaning now he was up for a triple murder. But this is Shu's weird logic. Anyway, he even goes ahead and sends Green a check for a thousand dollars to commit to this killing. And he says, I'll give you the other $49,000 after the job is done. But fortunately, at this moment in time, when the thousand dollars is transferred to Green, the FBI, they're just having a bit of a nosy. They're just like, we'll just have a little monitor. We'll be monitoring Shu's financial accounts because we suspect that this guy is a whole heap of not right and he may well do things that we do not approve of, even though he should just be on remand waiting for his trial. They didn't trust him. They kept checking. So because the FBI could basically prove that Shu had transferred this money to Green, they were able to get Green to confess to a contract killing agreement. So this is a man who has made it clear and is going through with exactly what he said. He told Mary that he would never leave her alone. She would always be at risk and he intends to carry out that threat. And when you track back and you're like, why are you so angry, Shu? because you weren't in the Vietnam War. I'm just putting it out there, you made that up. Why are you so angry? Because she didn't like his algebra formula. I mean, for somebody who was meant to be the most likely to succeed in his class, why didn't he just take advantage of that popularity and go around and be like, guys, thinking about a party trick? My party trick is to show girls my algebra formula. Is that, is that a good idea? And they'd have been like, no, it's not a good idea. No, no, don't do that. Um, we're, de we're demoting you from the most likely to succeed. Do you know, it's not one of those things that really we should hold against anybody because that person doesn't show enough interest or because they gave you a B. But that's what we're talking about. This is where the fixation begins. Also, when it comes down to his charges, as Shude crossed state lines, this is during Mary and Beth's kidnapping, it actually become a federal offence. So then he's tried in federal court. The defence psychiatrist, they stated that Shu, as far as they were concerned, displayed characteristics of paranoid schizophrenia. So paranoid schizophrenia, it's a really serious brain disorder. It's a thought disorder. It can mean that the person loses touch with reality. They can hallucinate. They can have terrifying delusions. And this is something that if Shu was dealing with, could to some degree express and explain why he was so fixated on the belief systems that he had but 
being schizophrenic certainly doesn't make you a criminal who abducts people and does terrible things to them by any stretch of the imagination. But this is what the defence are going to go for. Of course, they are they're going to be like, oh, he wasn't really his fault. He's just not mentally well. And it's like not really going to have any weight because there was so much planning. There was so much order to his crime. There was so much control. He seemed to be quite aware of what he was doing and why he was doing it. These are not things that are in line with somebody going through some delusionary episode. So the prosecution say that's absolute rubbish, he's not mentally ill at all. When we get to the trial and Mary's actually got to give evidence, she's clearly afraid of Shu because we know that she's already had a hit put on her from prison. And this is really justified because on one of the occasions where Mary's actually going ahead and giving evidence, and bearing in mind this is in a court, Shu jumps from his seat, charges at her, and he yells, bitch. Now, thankfully, he is stopped before he reaches her. So this is a man who, even in court, is desperate to carry out the retribution that he believes she deserves. Now, none of you are going to be surprised that after the 10-day trial, because it lasted 10 days and that was it, he's found guilty of kidnapping. It was clear it was him. There were witnesses who were alive to testify it was him. It was always going to be the case. But then we get to the third day of the trial for the murder of six-year-old Jason Wilkman. This is at Anoka District Court. And Shu, at this point, bearing in mind, is a massive threat, is, you know, shackled, tied to an officer of the law, anything, anything to prevent a man who already in court has managed to free himself from his seat and almost get to a victim and who has kidnapped people and kept them captive for a period of time and who has murdered a child and who has actually set a hit on one of the victims whilst in prison. This is somebody who clearly needs to be tethered to, I don't know, a very burly man. Or you would think so, wouldn't you? But no. Not only is Shu not tethered in any way, shape or form to somebody who can prevent it moving, he also manages to sneak a pocket knife, that's right, a weapon, from the prison into the courtroom. So now we have Shu armed in a courtroom. How is this happening? How am I telling you this story? How am I telling you this story? This is also why Ted Bundy escaped, isn't it? This is the kind of really poor administrative and organisational issues attended that lead to these situations playing out. How the hell is this man in a courtroom with a weapon in a situation where he isn't tied down because he's already tried to attack Mary? So Mary's giving evidence, which is obviously a very dangerous point for her, and she gets asked if she ever told her captor that she loved him, and she said no. She was then asked if she'd ever used it in a Christian sense, and she replies at this point, the Bible said to love your enemies. So she's highlighting that she considers him an enemy. At this point, Shu, who's already been a massive threat to her, he makes this animal-like scream. He runs 20 feet at her from the defense table he wraps both of his arms around her neck. He holds the blade to her throat. He threatens to kill her unless everyone stays back. Fortunately, an officer at this point manages to grab Mary and he pulls her to safety. But it actually took six officers to subdue Shu. And with respect, Mary was slashed very deeply across her face in the process. The gash went from her chin around the right side of her mouth and up onto her cheek. She needed 62 stitches. It left a really bad scar. Now, had that been her throat, as he fully intended it would be, she'd have been dead. How the hell did this man get to do that? How was any opportunity available to him to carry that out? Especially after the first attempt when he tried to attack her in court. Now, after this particularly brutal attack in court, when he was armed, in a situation that should never have happened, they do then handcuff him to the chair during the proceedings. It's unreal that I've actually just described that and that actually happened. When it comes down to Jason's murder, the prosecutors ultimately agree a plea deal. So Shu avoids first degree murder if he reveals where the boy's body is. So he agrees and then he takes the police to the location. So 
officers end up searching a remote Carlos Avery wildlife refuge and it's here that they discover his skeletal remains. When they look at the remains, they're able to establish that the six-year-old had basically died from blunt force trauma to the back of the head, but his whole body was just covered in similar blunt force trauma injuries. So it's likely that she would just beat Jason to death with the tire iron that he took from the car. It's really hard to imagine those final moments of that little boy's life. You know, one minute is playing with his friends, the next he's in the boot of the car, and then he's just beaten to death by this stranger. She was ultimately convicted of kidnapping Mary and Beth, of course he was, and he gets sentenced to life with a minimum term of 30 years in September 1980. After the second trial, he's convicted of second degree murder and kidnapping of Jason. At that point, he's sentenced to 40 years in 1981. I'm gonna be honest, he was gonna be in prison for life, but it kind of really grates me that that little boy didn't receive the murder charge that should have been granted for the loss of his life. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Shu, without a doubt, premeditated murdering that kid. And it really annoys me that his parents didn't get that sentencing for the actual first degree murder of their child. That said, at least they have a place to go and visit. And at least that little boy was brought home to them. It's harrowing that they ever experienced that. But I hate sometimes that these individuals, they get to make pleas when they don't deserve it. We get to 2010. And at this point, Shu is denied parole. Thank the Lord that he's denied parole. This man should never walk the streets. And fortunately, the judge is like, yeah, you're not, you're not getting parole. And he's like, oh, I want parole. He's like, yeah, I, I, you're not gonna. Why? Because you never walk in the streets again, sweetheart. So he says that he's gonna spend the rest of his life in prison. So what the judge actually intonated was that if he does get released from the actual prison, he'd be held probably indefinitely at a secure sex offender treatment facility because if they ever let him out of federal prison, he cannot walk the streets again. The judge said he was a sexually dangerous person. He had a sexually psychopathic personality and that the psychologist had established that he remained to this day a threat to society. So according to the reports, the psychological reports and evaluations that came back on Shu indicated that there was no sign of mental illness at all. And the psychologist wrote a really damning statement. They said, all this concludes, he is extremely dangerous. Shu exhibits utter lack of power to control sexual impulses, refusal of treatment opportunities, lack of a relapse prevention plan, violence demonstrated towards his victims, obsession and compulsion belief that no problem exists. I mean, is it just me that would like an hour in a room with Shu exploring that everything's all right and no problem exists according to him? Do you imagine sitting down and being like, let's just run through a few things. You kidnapped two innocent people, you did some horrible things to them, you killed a child, you also took a weapon into a court and tried to kill one of the poor victims in front of a whole courtroom of people. I did do all those things. And you don't think there's anything wrong with it? Well... I'm not specifically saying there's nothing wrong with it. I'm saying there's a reason for it. And what's the reason for it? She didn't like my algebra formula and she gave me a B. That's not a good enough reason. I was a Vietnamese prisoner of war. That's just a lie. Something like that would go on. I don't know. Just throwing it out there. Just like an hour with him. You weren't a Vietnamese prisoner of war. Stop lying. Anyway, the decision that he's never going to ever be allowed to roam the streets, obviously for Mary and for her family, is a massive relief. She'd never forgotten that he threatened to kill her and that if he was ever released and he had the chance, if she wasn't alive, he'd just kill her family. That in itself was something she had to bear day in, day out. He stole so much from her in so many ways. Shu is currently incarcerated in Federal Medical Center, Rochester. That's in Minnesota. He's 71 years of age now. And he suffers from arthritis and kidney failure. So he's not in the greatest of health. And when he had his parole hearing, he apparently stated this. The remorse and sorrow remains heavy on me. 
I regret acting in that matter. I chose to do wrong. I had no concern for anybody. I'm just going to throw it out there. According to the psychology reports, he doesn't seem that remorseful. And I think at your parole board meeting, you're just going to say whatever you can say to try and get out. Just throwing it out there. Now, Mary and her family, they're amazing. They got on with their lives. They were strong and they made the missionary trip back to the Philippines in 1981. And she and Herb have since moved back to the US and they've retired. Mary said she survived her ordeal by separating her soul from her physical body. So she literally disassociated. She was like, you can take me physically. You can harm my body, but you can't touch me. And I think that is such a powerful psychological mindset. Kind of gave me goosebumps even thinking like that because it's a way of maintaining that no one has a right to take from you. You know, from the inner you, from your core. Beth, her daughter at the time, she's a grandmother now. Can you believe that? So they've gone on to live really loving and prosperous lives. And she since said of Shu, he didn't want to leave physical scars, just emotional. He took 53 days of our lives. If I let him have one more, evil wins. And I'm not going to let that happen. So resilient. So powerful. Another testament to the mindset that Mary had during this experience and after is that she actually had the opportunity to pursue civil action against Shu. So she could have sued him for damages. And at the time, his electronics business, it was successful and it was worth around $250,000. But she decided not to. She said vengeance was God's. So in her belief system, she feels he'll have his judgment. He'll have his moment. He'll pay for his sins. Personally, I'd have been like, vengeance is God's and your shop is now mine. I would have taken it. I'd have sued him for every single penny that he got. He sliced her face up and he stole her freedom. She absolutely deserved that. If only to donate to charity, but people like Mary and Irv and Beth and her family per se are unique. They're powerful and unusual and psychologically they stand out because of the way that they are in these scenarios. Unlike me, who would have been $250,000 richer. Now, Shu clearly had, when we look at him, a delusional and dangerous personality. He's an individual who was highly manipulative. There were early warning signs, violent behavior as a child. His mother was scared of him. Criminal activity as a teen, starting fires. That's part of the McDonald triad. Persistent lying always claiming to be right. He was narcissistic. He was controlling. He was an individual who believed that what he wanted was more important than anything else. And the other big delusion that he had was if he forced Mary long enough, he'd have a loving relationship with her, all the whilst holding her and her daughter hostage, raping on her a daily basis. He exhibited ultimate cruelty, acts that were horrifying, whilst in the same moment, trying to display affection towards Beth, playing happy families, taking them on family trips out. On one level, you could say there was a level of psychological turmoil. You know, if his victims did what they were told, then he treated them better. If they didn't, they suffered. So he made them act in a certain way towards them. You know, they would act pleasantly, but they didn't mean it. He wanted their love, but he had absolutely no way of getting it. Clearly, she was an individual who suffered from some kind of delusions, even though in court it wasn't noted that he actually, as far as the prosecution were concerned, suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. What we can say is it's not typical actions of an individual who is well-adjusted and well-balanced. Kidnapping, forcing somebody to pretend that they love you, murdering an innocent child because they witnessed you taking these people, these are not actions of an individual who is typical, and she is certainly anything but typical. He raped her on a daily basis. He forced her to be affectionate. He even was kind to her daughter, all the while threatening her daughter's life. He had family trips out with them. So to some degree, you can see that this is an individual who only has care and concern over what they feel. There is no room for another human being. And if that other human being wants something different, well, 
the consequences will be very dire for them. He forced his victims to play a role in his fantasy. He wasn't interested in the fact that all the while they were in fear for their lives. When you think about the possible diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, I suppose it could possibly be true. He fell in love with Mary when he was a student and then he developed a delusional fixation on her. But the evaluation since suggests that there wasn't that in mental illness. Yes, there was definitely antisocial personality disorder. I mean, God, he displays the characteristics, doesn't he? As the appeal judge stated, sexual psychopathic personality. So Mary's story, when you think about what I've told you today, it's incredible, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. And the great thing is at least we can talk about the fact that she and her daughter survived the ordeal. It's a testament to their strength. It's a testament to their refusal to accept that he controls their future, their happiness. They had great faith and it sounds like that faith paid dividends. I am so glad that Mary and Beth managed to get away from this horrible situation. I'm so glad that they escaped. This case is one of those which is absolutely unbelievable and so sensational to some degree because of the aspects that meant that this poor innocent woman and her daughter just going about their business ended up in a scenario that most of us cannot even wrap our heads around to even begin to imagine. But sometimes because of that sensational aspect of this, it kind of overshadows a really important and poignant part. And that is a senseless murder of Jason Wiltman, that happy six-year-old boy who had his whole life ahead of him. It's unbelievable to think that when he was just playing with his friend, just noticing that guy, acting a little bit strange and wandering over to that car and just looking to see what was going on would lead to him being battered and killed by this horrific human predator. That is an absolute tragedy because he didn't get to walk away from this situation. Unfortunately, Mary and Beth did. Just to point out that even though I've covered their kidnap and their imprisonment, we can't forget that little boy who lost his life that day. I hope you found the case interesting. Let me know in the comments. Give me a like if you've liked it. If you like my content, I release it on a Wednesday and a Sunday. So if you like crime and consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. Thanks to all my Patreon and my YouTube community members. You make my content better. Thank you so much. And also don't forget, if you want to get the Emma mattress, then there's a massive discount. Just put in Emma K. See you again next time. Bye.